Welcome in. Today on Undercurrents, I am sitting down with Matthias Omatola. Matthias is part of the cinema 4D and 3D animation space out in LA. He is someone who cares deeply about community and about equipping artists. He's a published author of an Amazon best-selling book titled The Five Most Important Things You Didn't Learn in School. And we're going to go deep on a number of topics over the next hour, but really the starting place is rebirthing. Matthias experienced a catastrophic knee injury at 16. I'll have him share the story, but what it did is it gave him an opportunity to start designing a new life. And yeah, we, we're, well, let's talk about the importance of being present, being grounded, being aware of the energy that we bring and that we exude. We go deep on honesty for a bit. And what I thought was really compelling about this conversation is that he grew up in a Jehovah Witness home. Him and I have crossover, but we really swim in like different lanes. We're using different language. And sometimes I found it to be so helpful to hear someone say something that resonates with me, but to say it in a different way. And I think that happened in this episode. So that's one of the things that's definitely gonna, gonna stick with me. Before we go, one quick favor to ask, if you would go over to the YouTube and just look up Undercurrents with Benji Block on YouTube and subscribe, my goal is to get to 100 subscribers. Hopefully in the next couple months, I am nowhere close. I don't really know how to share out the YouTube. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify, you might go, why would I need to go to the YouTube? What's over there? You can watch some clips that I have been sharing on Instagram and that sort of thing, but that would be one sort of bonus. There's like some little clips that that I push out during the week. I also am going to start putting clips up, which means three to 10 minute videos, kind of the best of from these episodes. And that'll be a way to, to add some value. And hopefully over time, we'll do some different things with the YouTube, but that that's my call to action today. If you will, if you're on YouTube for any other reason, you're watching your, whatever other videos you love, if you don't mind, go over to undercurrents with Benji block and subscribe. All right, no more waiting. Here it is. My full conversation with Matthias Omatola. I have things that I want to talk to you about, places I want to go, but I thought it'd actually be interesting to just start with where are you these days? And when I say that, I don't mean physically, I don't mean work wise. I really mean like, what do you find yourself really caring about these days, Matthias? Well, right now, I think we're at a very unique time in human history. Right. I feel that we are on the precipice of another dark age or golden age, depending on how we calibrate from this point. And and that's with, you know, technology, it's with the globalization. There's, there's a lot of different things that kind of put us there. And the things that I'm most passionate about right now are one and always am is healing the man woman relationship. And that's the masculine feminine relationship with people. I've been doing that a lot through um, going into the dark. So for me personally, I'm on an emergence path right now as I went into, you know, um, some dark times and, and kind of really finding when you're talking about the undercurrent is these places where people go when they are going through a midlife crisis, when they're going through a major change in their life and it takes them a while to come out. It's not that overnight, it's they're in it for a while. They're learning what they need to learn there and then evolving out of that. So that's what I've been in the world of. And then with the world of AI and technology and how that's, you know, looking to reshape our world. So in that, I'm looking to get people focused on the golden age and what does that mean? And that's pretty much what you read on you know, my LinkedIn is connecting people is how do we get connected so we become more empathic towards each other. I see us as a collective organism of a being where we're considered, I would say countries would be like organs of the planet you know, and each one is flowing and sharing it different things. And the people are like the blood or the white blood cells that are helping other cells and to do different things. So I feel that we all have functions here, but we're kind of caught up in some of these artificial constructs that keep us away from our, our best use of our uniqueness 
in this world. And so that's mm-hmm. where I'm on that reemergence path myself and now using both the technology and encouraging people to come together in community and go into these deeper spaces. So for me, I feel like I'm just about to hit the scene, even though I released my book last year. You know, I got, you know, five most important things you don't learn in school, bestseller, but I did not keep going with it. So this is something that I'm, I'm looking to reconnect and evolve to help more people. Yeah. What, what caused you not to like end up going more in with the book? Was it stuff that was coming up for you? Like personally that caused you to take the break or what? No, it's just timing. (laughs) It's literally just timing. Yeah. It it was out there because it it was to the point where I need to get this out because people need it. Like it's just been a pain point for far too many people. They need to have a resource, but I do also work, you know, full time in the world of technology and manage an entire community with, you know, uh, Maxon and MoGraph. And I'm with the whole motion graphics community is is one of the the communities that I really support. And that's nonstop. It's like, there's events going on all the time. There's artists that I'm, I'm preparing for their next presentation or their first presentation. So helping of the artist, which to me is the most important because when people see artists, artists give people the empowerment to self-express. When people see artists, it, it speaks to the uniqueness of other people. And artists have designed our world from the house that we live in to the books that we read, from the games that we play. Everything has designed, it's been designed by the hand of an artist or the words that we read, usually, besides AI now, that's a different thing. But artists have been been responsible for that for all of human history. Artists make the world much more rich. So I've been supporting that because I feel when you can have the artists kind of lead everybody into that creative, unique space, it helps other people and it permissions other people to be more uniquely themselves and to come from the heart. I love how you're connecting those passions and seeing the overlay of your interests and and then how that flows into art and the book, all of that. I'll re-reference the title of the book real quick. The five most important things you didn't learn in school. When you're 16, you have a moment that is pretty remarkable. So you grew up in Chicago, you're Iowa university for football scholarship. And then you have this major injury where essentially track and field. So off season from football And you, what was it? It was your leg, right? Yeah, it was, I tore my ACL, my meniscus in my right knee, knee, uh, doing discus. So take me into that moment a bit. I would love to start there in your journey. So I'm in the ring, in that beautiful circle for, you know, if you see in track and field for shot put and discus, and I was really good at shot put and went to state, not champion, but I went the top nine in, in, in state and all that fun stuff. It was like towards the end of practice and I was alone there practicing. And one of the things was their shoes. So they're smooth shoes that you would normally wear for discus so you can spin and rotate. I wasn't. I was in my running shoes. And when I went to do that, my foot stayed planted and then the rest of my body rotated. So the knee just twisted. And... Mm. and felt a pop and all that and was just like oh wow this this feels like an injury and then as i tried to move and start making my way to the trainer's office which is probably about 300 yards or so away from where the field was um i just started to get an emotional feeling like this isn't like anything else that i experienced in my injuries thus far i've had sprains i've had tears like i've done that stuff This felt uniquely different. And when I got to the training, you know, room and they took a look and everything, and then they let me know like, Hey, no, this is, this is actually really, this is, this is serious. This is not something you're just going to walk off, throw some ice on it and whatever the case may be. And that pretty much started my whole internal journey of like, what just happened and where do I go? So it's somewhat being in a state of confusion, listening to my dad, who's a nurse anesthetist. You know, I have my uncle who's an orthopedic surgeon. So I had, you know, medical people around that I could talk to my trainer. They've dealt with a lot of different injuries. And then from there, getting the surgery scheduled and everything else was, 
you know, somewhat terrifying because I was, you know, going under all the way. I was there with my dad and I remember being comforted because he's a nurse anesthetist. He could be in the room, you know, I'm, I'm going to sleep. He's just letting me know, walking me through that process. But I feel it was like one of the most comforting times with my father because I could feel him because one, I've never been in surgery with him. Like I've never seen him do that yeah. work. I've seen him at home. You know, he was a very religious man too. I grew up Jehovah Witness, so a very stern household as, as far as rules and structures when it came to like what could be done. Um, but I felt compassion from him in that moment. And that was a really big thing that that care and that love of a father that I didn't really see, feel until that moment. I always felt discipline. I always felt judgment. I always felt that. But in that moment before I went out, I actually felt like love and support from my father. That was a, a really heart opening thing. Then I woke up because <laughs> it was literally like that. It was like I remember that moment, but then I remember just waking up. And it was completely like waking up or almost like a rebirthing at that point. The anesthesia was still in me. I was in a lot of pain um, somewhat, but it was more like a numbness all over. And just my mouth was so dry. <laughs> it was just the, the yep. driest yep. it's ever been. And I couldn't say anything because it was so dry, I guess, because that's where the tubes are and everything else. I'm trying to like signal for some uh, something and it just took forever. And eventually I got like a rag I could suck on or some ice chips. And it was just, it was a magical moment to have just some ice chips and a, a wet <laughs> rag, let me tell you. Um, but yeah, so after that, that's when things started to really hit me. And especially when I saw my knee is because this was a part of me and I had over 110 staples in it from the middle, left and right. It looked like a Frankenstein leg. And that's what really hit me. And I was really in and out of it. That's when I really asked myself that question, like, who am I if I can't play, play football? Because I was smelling the cut grass of the summer because this was you know you know may spring may and it was like oh i smelled the cut grass and i knew people were getting ready and they were you know i knew what was taking place elsewhere and that kind of started leading me internally into trying to figure out who would i be without football and when i asked that question I actually got a response from another aspect of me that i wasn't really aware of and that said do you really want to know and I knew I could say no. I could say no. It wasn't like I could like it had to be done. I could say no and avoid it. Or I could see yes. And it's kind of a blue and red pill moment with Morpheus in the Matrix. It's like, mm -hmm. do you really want to know? And I said yes. And then it took me on a process that uh, what I would consider a rebirth or at that time, you know, consider the path of the Phoenix. And every part of me started getting taken away. So I said, okay, show me. And then the voice is like, okay, so who are you if you can't see? And I couldn't see. I was like, I'm trying to open my eyes, can't see, can't really understand. It's like, okay, who are you if you can't hear? And it went silent. And all I heard was like my heartbeat and things within the body. Who are you if you can't feel? And then more and more, things would just get taken away. Like my senses would get taken away. Mm. Okay, you can't taste. All right, oh, my family, my family will come visit. And then it was like, your family's dead. And I felt these things very viscerally. So I was crying, like, oh, my family just, died. what do you mean my family's dead? And it's like, okay, well, I'm a man. It's like, okay, well, your genitals were removed in an accident. That was, that was something else that, that happened. And so you're paralyzed. And every single thing that I could hold onto that I had a concept of, that was me. I'm a man. I'm from Chicago. It's like Chicago's wiped out. There was a war. I got hit with a nuclear bomb. No one knows who you are, whatever. So here I am on a bed. I can't feel, can't see, can't hear, don't have connection to anybody. Nobody knows who I am. I can't sense any of these things, but there was an aspect of me that couldn't go away. So as everything went away, I just found this spark and I just found this twinkle of just this light within. And I was like, all right, but how do I, I can't literally get rid of that. There's, there's nothing on that. And it, that's when the voice was like, this is who you are. This is that divine essence, if you will, that would be a, a term, but this is that spark of consciousness. This is that spark of divinity. This is life. This is you. And everything else is just put on top of this. This can't be removed. This is eternal. 
everything else you can put on. And guess what? The good news is everything else is a choice. So yeah. you actually can choose that. So from this point, you can go ahead and build yourself out. You are not all those other things. Those are just things that have happened. But from this point, you can build yourself out. So who do you choose to be? And I was like, great. Okay. This is a lot. <laughs> this is a lot. So I, I looked at all the different characteristics. Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility and Captain America and like defending people and these different courageous heroes that were within my mind, these characteristics, I looked at helping people, working with people, lo loving people, and I felt at that point, I understood more of religion and compassion and Jesus. And, and that is like, oh, I feel that that connection, everybody is that spark. I don't feel that the separation. And now I can see that spark in everyone, even though they have all these layers on top of them. This is the one thing that unites us. This is what beats our heart. This is why our heart beats. It's like we can put everything in a Petri dish, all those ingredients, but it doesn't beat because this spark isn't there. So because I had that visceral experience, and at that time, actually, I was, I was quite skeptical of my religious path. <laughs> you know, I'll be honest, I was like very yeah. frustrated. We, we, I was very frustrated with, with uh, the Jehovah Witness path and everything else. But that gave me a real deeper understanding to spirit. I could understand things, even though it played out differently in different religions and stuff. I, could, I felt a deeper compassion to all people when I came out of that. And then from there... I knew why I did what I did when I did. And I had much more choice in my life at 16 that I saw people in their 50s and 60s that have just been playing out this script. They weren't necessarily consciously making choices from this place. And so from that, I knew that as my identity and I built myself. Okay. So there's so many places I want to go with, with that story, but I feel like a couple of things really stand out to me. I've talked to a few people recently who can point to those types of moments. Mine didn't happen in an injury. Mine was very much through the community that I was a part of, the church that I was a part of, making some decisions that really caused me to just go on a, what, what is all of this? And kind of the same, what I, am I without journey, uh, but not in like a moment quite like yours. I love the way that you experienced that. I've also heard it from someone else in a very, like a similar health context where she was then bedridden and it was supposed to be in like the most exciting part of her career. And she's going, why the heck is this happening to me now? And it sends her on this path of questions, right? I was talking to someone recently who said he would see all these patients and a lot of them were in their 60s, 50s, maybe a few in their 40s, maybe a couple in their 30s that had had catastrophic events where it started them down a path of asking, like, who is that true, true self buried underneath all of these things? It's crazy to me. <laughs> I don't have a better word for it. It's crazy to me that this happened to you at 16. And one of the key questions I have is, once you are aware of that, how does it show up in your life? What decisions did you start making as a teenager that because that would set you up to think that vastly different than a lot of the people your age? And how did it change the way that you interacted with, let's say, your parents? I want to get into some of the immediate after effects of that moment. Definitely. Well, I, I refer to that moment as a lay, L-A-E, or a life altering event. And you'll yeah. hear it all the time. It's also, you know, moments in the stories of heroes it's like that moment where now they're on this path they are have their quest set out for them from this moment everything else changes these things didn't matter i walked away from my marriage i walked away from my job i walked away from so you end up kind of secluding yourself from all these other things and there, there's a different calling of what's important to you what happened for me is i just got absolute clarity it's like things the system, like you could start reading the code of the matrix is what it was like for me. So I could see mm. who I was talking to. I could see and I could feel their wounds from their childhood. I could see what they're connected to, what they feel is important to them, even if it's not, but it is to them. I could see the constructs that were put on people. I could see the masks that people were, were wearing. And at the same time, I could be compassionate to it. It didn't make me upset. Yeah. It was, I yep. understood for that moment of forgive them. They know not what they do which was something that was like, wow, that's a, you know, a big act of compassion. 
But when you see people in pain, you see people twisting themselves to be certain ways to fit into society and survive. And you don't necessarily feel a strong magnetic a attachment to those different things. It's very different. I felt immediately responsible for humanity. I felt that it, it was like, these are all my brothers, my sisters, my children. They're all my mothers. They're all my fathers. And on top of that, I'm also their elder if they are not aware of this. If somebody else is aware of this, and I've met other beings that you know, are like very conscious of this. And then it's just like, cool, we're just seeing each other through eternity. We recognize each other as the spark. And then anybody else, I recognize them where they are within their evolution or where they are in their pain. And it's fine. It's like, it, it just really cut down a lot of judgment and yep. just being able to see things really clearly. Okay. So on that though, I think what has, what I've noticed too is like, when you go, when you've sensed or had that experience, you feel new, changed, sense the evolution. There's also this, at least this is where I am, and I can only speak for me. There's a hard way of trying to figure out how to talk about it and not like, because some people are going to hear that. They're going to go, that just sounds pretentious. It sounds like, okay, well, I know something you don't. And I, it's not what you're saying. <laughs> it's not what I feel because I know like, but how do you try to start to communicate like or be an invitation for people to continue on their journey? Or do you just not sense that that pressure because you know, like everyone's just walking their own path and, and that's it's just how it's meant to be anyway? As I awoken from this, two things that I I read right away that shaped a lot of my life is the power of the subconscious mind and the one hour orgasm. It was like, mm. and, and that those two things really helped change one going through puberty, you know, 16 in the height of puberty, understanding relationships and male female dynamics in the world of sexuality in a more balanced, more conscious, connected way. And yeah. the subconscious mind and how that plays everything out. So I just luckily had those books. I came across those books as I'm reading to recover. I can't walk. I really went deep into those and understanding the subconscious mind. Then it made it really easy for me because I was able to look at people's programming. I could understand that these things that people were doing were subconscious. And if I'm trying to interact with them, um, interacting with their subconscious mind that's running these routines. It's not necessarily that they consciously can have these type of conversations. And once again, it's not like it's better than or this and that. It's until you have that experience, it really doesn't matter. So my thing was, okay, what do I want to bring to this situation? I have choice. Yeah. If the way that I see it is the person who is the most spiritually connected, is the most responsible person for the energy in that environment, period. Breaking in with a timeout right here because I think that sentence needs a rewind and needs us to talk about it a little further. He said, the way that I see it, the person that is the most spiritually connected is the most responsible person for the energy in that environment. And I think my first just knee jerk thought is I've been in a lot of environments where people don't take responsibility for what they bring to the table and the energy that they exude and the types of response they have to hardship or the type of response that they have to other people's bad attitudes or towards not being understood. And the people that I admire the most are those that can have this sense of calm, right? I think of Jesus sleeping on a boat during a storm. I think of someone who can uh, hate, vitriol, not being understood, can be kind of thrown at them. And the response is one of love and compassion and trying to include rather than exclude. And there's a spiritual maturity there there's a controlling of, hey, I can't uh, decide how you're going to respond. But as for me and the space that I occupy, I'm going to 
raise the the level of just consciousness here and just be present and be open handed and we are responsible for us at all times because that's what we have agency over and we get to decide and what we get to choose and so that line really stood out to me that if we are spiritually mature we take responsibility for the energy that we bring to any room okay let's jump back into my conversation with matthias the way that i see it is the person who is the most spiritually connected is the most responsible person for the energy in that environment period that is your responsibility if i'm going to a place and you know somebody is not well i'm going to be the one who feels it so i'm going to have to be able to see them i've had somebody a couple years ago die on the streets in front of me literally fall down dead somebody running up on the beach and having to go get a lifeguard you know cpr all that and people are crowding around and doing all that and this is on the beach in, in san diego and and people are all there and i step aside i sit down and i meditate and mm -hmm. it, trying to actually bring peace and connect with this person whose heart stopped where they're going yep. and i'm just meditating and i'm just feeling the calm of everybody else and i hear a woman when they were in chaos to her young child let's pray. And before that, there was chaos. But I knew I was like, okay, I know what's going to happen here. Some people have phones out, they're doing all this other stuff. But I'm like, this is such a unique time in the human experience, if this person is going to path, but we can also hold a space for the spirit to actually anchor them. Like, I didn't know that. But that's just what I'm called to do in that moment. I can't be like, hey, everybody yeah. do this thing. It's like, you know, you have to lead by <laughs> example, you have to be mm -hmm. compassionate, you have to be in the heart. It's been something that has kind of guided me. And it's like, hey, it might not be for everybody. But I just know I have to take care of my brothers and sisters, I have to be loving and I have to show what that is. Because they might not understand it, but they will feel it. They can't not yep. feel it when I hug them and I wait to feel my heartbeat feeling their heartbeat. They can't. And they yep. shared that. So it's more about how to guide people through experiences that they then yep. can't deny. They have, they've experienced it. They can't deny it. There are some really key spiritual type experiences that the church gave me that like, are just really beautiful. And in a lot of the kind of walking away, deconstructing, thinking through what was all of that, there's still those moments that stick out where I'm like, no, nah, that's just beautiful beyond the language that I had then. That that was real and essential, regardless of the the mental model I had at the time. But then I had to leave to find a lot of what you're saying in in agency, right? And like I I need there's a lot that I get to decide. There's a lot that I get to choose that many times I don't take responsibility for. Or before I was just kind of it was up to the whims of like the beliefs I was handed. That's that happens in religion a lot. You're handed beliefs and told yeah. things that should matter to you instead of having to actually process if all of this gets wiped out, like what do you care about? What are you going to choose to live in the direction of? And so values have become really important to me in defining what those things are for you. What was it for you? What language did you have to go, okay, I, I can sense the agency I have. I want to be the person in the room that brings that energy, that brings that perspective. What language did you start to use? And how did you begin to say, this is what matters most to, to Matthias? Why I'm here is to help people heal that man woman relationship. This is stuff that is ancient in in our in our pain. If we look at the Garden of Eden and you know that whole story, men angry at w women, women angry at men, and there's kind of been this war of the sexes for a long time. So that was something that I would say is was ordained upon me. One of the questions that I asked was, we have stories of the perfect man from Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, these great beings, and, uh, you know, per perfect woman from like Kuan Yin and these goddesses and things like that. But there wasn't a lot of stories of the perfect relationship. So I really looked at and pursued much deeper connection of understanding between the sexes. And not just being in a situation where guys playing games to sleep with women and women trying to manipulate guys and, and these different things. And it, it just felt so 
immature to me, even at a very young age. So that was something that I knew that I needed to work on. I was like, that's something that I continually need to grow and develop a deeper understanding here so I can help guide people because that's the foundation of all life. And when you don't have the foundation of life that's harmoniously working with the energetics together, then that's going to be problematic for everything that comes from that situation. They don't have mm. a reference point that's quality. So that reference point is off. So they're always going to be searching for that. And as they search it, they'll find more distortions and pick up bits and pieces, but it's never necessarily heart centric. So to make those choices, that's where I said, finding the characteristics, like you say, values. So the principles and the values that I had were shared with a lot of heroes. Now, it wasn't for me to go, you know, don on a cape and go fight crime and everything. But for me, it was more of showing up in a way to be able to consciously raise vibration. And over the yeah. time, I've studied in, you know, different mystery schools, uh, Mastering Alchemy with Jim Self and Roxanne Burnett, it's a collection to understand emotions more, to understand frequency, power versus force is also a great book that talks about emotions on a frequency scale and higher emotions have the, these different frequencies. And the way that I like to put it is when you walk into a room and everyone's about to get laid off or you're walking into a funeral where someone has died, there is a certain frequency within the room that's palpable. We don't really talk about it. We can, we can just feel it. You don't, you don't need to. Yep. Or you can walk into a room where there's a surprise party and the energy is all waiting and you got palpable. in there and, and the, the guest isn't there yet. And you can feel all of the, the, that buzz that's in the room that's just something different. Or if you've ever been around a danger, you can actually feel these things. But it's something that is within our body that we haven't really attuned. When I became more self-aware, those things became more refined. So I'm going to go off script here because I want to go where your passion is and like what like this feminine, masculine stuff. I like, I'm not probably going to have the best articulation, but I want to learn from you. Like, that's why we're mm. here. Right. So we might as well go into, to what you've learned, studied, found, talk to me a little bit about specifically how the masculine doesn't understand the feminine. What happens there that you could help make us aware of what should we start maybe paying more attention to? I love asking that question to people. What are you paying attention to that Maybe I could, for a few minutes, just see from your perspective, put your lens on and go, okay, like I want to, I want to sense this a little bit and go into it. Yeah, definitely. And I actually have a, a real good list that I'll actually um, run through. Now we're in the time of like gender roles. And when I'm talking about masculine and feminine, I, um, Justin Patrick Pierce and his wife, London, they do a great job. Uh, they teach yoga of intimacy. And um, so they, they use the term alpha and omega when it comes to energy, alpha being the masculine, omega being the feminine. And if you think of yin and yang energy, right, it's yep. almost like the giving and the receiving. So if you think of it more as magnetic north and south, I found that there's certain characteristics that often feel really good when you embody those as a masculine in a loving conscious way and the same thing. Um, from the feminine embodied in a loving conscious way. Because often when we talk about traditional gender roles, we're talking about uh, it from an oppressive standpoint. This is the burden of the man. This is the burden of the woman and these different things versus these are roles kind of like the white blood cell, the red blood cell and, and these yep. different things that support each other and complement each other. Not necessarily that we're equal. We're actually complementary. Complementary isn't equal. There's a different energetic dynamic amongst complementary. You wouldn't, you know, it's like, oh, the lock and the key, are they equal? It's like, what, what are you talking about? They, they perform different functions and they work together. It's, so, I think of it in terms of harmony as mm -hmm. well, just as a musician. I love the imagery of that or the sound of that because yes. when you hear a harmony, you're not thinking about which one. <laughs> matters more you're thinking about what they sound like together and uh there's just a beauty in in both of the notes being hit and sung so i love yeah. i love the way you put that yeah har harmony is it and in order to have that it's th there's a couple things so from the masculine or the alpha 
this is what I, I see is the alpha energy or the masculine energy is leading, protecting, providing, building, commanding, deciding, dominating, and owning, right? And these are from a loving place. That, that's the big key here is the loving place because the feminine doesn't open and become receptive to these different things if love isn't involved with that. So being able to do those different things and hold those different things from a place of love is what really helps open the feminine and have her feel safe, right? And for that, the feminine or the omega receptive energy is see as follow, please, serve, appreciate, obey, accept, submit, and surrender. Where some of these words like obey, it seems like, oh, it's such a terrible thing. But when you take a look at it, it's not obeying from the place of being less than. It's when you're as a team, right? So mm -hmm. if you think about it, like it's easy for me to think about like in sports, right? If a coach calls out a play and I disobey that play and, you know, something goes wrong, I'm not going to be like, I'll do whatever I want. <laughs> it's like, no, I like, you don't, you're not the boss of me. It's like, no, we we're working together. And mm -hmm. in that, I trust your leadership. You're seeing things, you're seeing opportunities. I, I trust we're in this together. I trust that you care. So you can, like, as a quarterback, you can give commands and the rest of the team obeys those commands. And no one's like, well, I should give commands. I should do that. It's like, no, we're working on as a team. My role is to see opportunities in these different places, create those op opportunities, call out those opportunities, and to run certain plays. So when you look at it that way, you're coming at it from a team perspective. But since people are so individually Focus. they never form that team first that then allows them to be able to obey without it sounding like something terrible or for somebody to command that sounds like it's coming from a place of oppression versus a place of love. If I'm commanding someone to do something and I love them, I'm looking out for them, it's very different than if I'm commanding them and I just want to feed my ego extremely different is like, hey, this is where I'm trying to build my life. This is who I'm looking to join me on this journey. This is the things that I want to do. Are these things beautiful to you? Great. Now we take the time so you can really see that I'm a person who's about this. I live this way. You see what my values are. And now do you want to be guided by these values? Do you want to live into these values? Do you want to live from these values? Or do these things really align? And can we agree that we will operate as a team? And if I fall off of these different values, you will see that. You, you'll, be, you'll call those out at me. But the thing is, a lot of times people are led from ego, right? And, and self-validation versus love or greater purpose. If you have a purpose, and it's really clear and it's coming from a loving place where it's in service to other people, you can go through hardship. And that's one of the things is like when you're on a team and I feel like so many people should be involved in team sports because we're in a community. We depend on people all the time. I depend on people yep. to follow traffic laws. And if they can't follow those traffic laws then we're all in danger, like there's so many things that we depend on other people performing a certain function for our lives to be livable. So developing first, knowing what the person submits to, right? When you're choosing to be with someone and they're leading you, what's leading them? Is it power? Is it money? Is it lust? Is it these different things? Is it spirit? Is it to create a better community? Is, are they led by their drive to have a beautiful, healthy family that's full of fun, adventure, and growth? Like these different things people don't ask. And I feel that a lot of times people are just afraid to ask the serious questions and to sit down and to really go about it in a fun way of saying, oh, I want to create this with my life. I'm excited. They're like, oh, I don't want to say this because I don't want to offend them. Or maybe this is too much. Instead of being unapologetic and just wanting what you want, like, hey, this is what I want. Does it match with you? Oh, awesome. Let's go play that game. That's the analogy that I use for most people is when we're kids, we're, we play and we would say, hey, let's play this game. And then when you decide to play that game, guess what? You play it fully. You're like, oh, do you want to play tag? Yes, I want to play tag. You run as fast as you can. You run away as fast as you can. You want to play hide and seek. Yeah, you do your best job doing that. When we get into relationships, 
uh, everybody's often like one toe in one toe out instead of hey do you want to play this game of life where we get together we work together we support each other we complement each other we we put our resources together we build a family do you want to play like fully when you say yes then you actually play fully and that's the problem is because we're not actually setting ourselves up for success because we don't go through it. We go out at it as a game, but we don't talk about the rules. We don't talk about the outcomes. <laughs> we don't talk about these other things. And this is where what I consider like a point-based system or the economy of relationships yep. where I do this for you. That means you do this for me. I do this for you. You do this for me. Instead of this is what I do naturally. This is what I do naturally. These are the things that we value. How do we support each other and operate as a team? Because as a team, you can do things greater than you could as an individual. But a lot of people are worried. And there's, there's a lot of trauma and other things and a lot of messaging that is kind of guiding people away from working together. This individualism over everything is, is you're just looking at, once again, the ego. I often think of it um, almost as a, a pendulum that people are, we're all swinging on from individualism to, to tribe or community. And it's a beautiful thing, but you just, it's almost like an unraveling where you're going, okay, I have to learn a personal agency in order to show up for my community in the correct way. And then sometimes we'll lean really heavy into community or uh, you'll see people that end up codependent in some ways, whether it's to one person or a community. And, and I felt, I sensed that in church, right? Uh, but I can even sense that in specific relationships that I've had, where then there's a, a, the next evolution where it's, oh, this is an invitation back into sensing self. And then when you sense that sense of self, that spark internally, you show up for your community in a different way. And it's this constant like needing to find the right lane to where ego's not driving you, your personality and your individualism isn't driving you, but also you don't find full identity based on this person. Like, so I like how we've sort of walked both lines in this conversation because both are so important that I could, I can honestly sense that there will be people that will listen to this that are probably on opposite sides of that, that need to be tempted. Like, Hey, you're hyper communal and finding all of your self-worth and self-value in other people and what they think. Like, it's time to swing back into some agency. And then you're going to have yeah. people that are over here that are like, dude, I feel so isolated. I feel so like I, it's me on an island, me building my thing. And they kind of need to swing back into community and like the beauty that is that sensing, or, like the dance that you have with other people, or maybe it's in a marriage, like that sense that you have with that other person. I love that. We almost stumbled our way into that, but like, that's going to be a major thing that I'm thinking about after this, because I feel like we need both. Like if I don't show up and know who I am, that's the shittiest times in my marriage. Like I can point to mm. them, man. Like I can yeah. point to them knowing like, I don't know where we're going. Really resonate with with a lot of what you just said, what do you what do you feel about the imagery of that pendulum? Does that does that resonate or make sense with you? It, it does. Like when I look at it um, from those aspects, definitely. And I and I've been on both sides of those pendulums. An exercise that I do is I go to the end of my life, and mm. I go to my last breath, and that's where yep. I sit and reflect on the decision that I'm going to make today the interaction yeah. that I'm going to have. So being able to live from your last breath kind of takes away a lot of fear because it's already gone. You know that this is the last one. So you get to look at, okay, what's really important to you. And the things that I found that are really important to people have been important throughout time and they don't really change. It's that idea that you've been able to self-express. There's something within you that wants to come alive that you've been of value to other people. Because if you're doing things that you, you, you don't have any feedback mechanisms, you don't know how you actually engage and interact with the world. If you put a smile on people's face, you know, some people even like to troll other people just because getting a reaction out of them makes them feel validated that they can do something in this world because they feel so useless that I don't know if I can make someone smile, but I can sure make them frown. If I can make them frown, that means I can make some type of change and I feel somewhat powerful. The thing that really anchors me in the deeper understanding is if all of people were to go away, life would not be that enjoyable. Now, 
sure, if there's a lot of annoying people that go away, it might be a little bit more enjoyable, <laughs> but here's the game that we're playing. But it's really the quality of our relationships determines the quality of our, our life, period. It, and that's why it's, you know, the first thing in my book is the first thing that I talk about is, is relationship. How do you relate to these different things? Is, and are you aware of how you relate to them? Are you a re aware of how you relate to your ego and how you relate to yourself? Are you aware of how you relate and how you show up to other people and how they experience you? You know, one of the questions that I love to ask is what is it like to be in your presence? Yeah. When you, know, when other people have to think about that, what is it like to be in your presence? What does your audience actually think? Like, forget what you think. What does your audience experience when they're actually involved in interacting with you? What does it feel like? And does that feel the way that you want them to feel? Are people more relaxed? Are they more anxious? Are they happy? What are you actually creating in your environment? So that helps me mm -hmm. with the, the pendulum. And because I know yeah. there's certain things that I have to do within myself to be structured, to be centered, to be confident, to be competent, that allow people in my presence to feel a certain way. I have to be self-loving and bring that love to the outside. Other than, otherwise, they're not going to feel love. They're going to feel like, oh, this guy's just a people pleaser or anything else. But if you're grounded, oh, it feels like he's sharing this love with me versus he's giving himself away. There's this ability for us to decide our our, our values, the way that we're going to operate in the world. But when you start to build on top of that, a lot of times you used Spider-Man, like that great power, the responsibility, you sense some of those things, but then it, it causes an, an, a reaction of like, I'm going to go out and do something. It's been very conscious in the relationships that I have, my own interpersonal relationships, both friendships and romantic as well mm -hmm. as how I guide and support others in theirs. You know, when I do any type of coaching or any type of communication on the subject, how am I helping people both from an experience? Because like I said, there wasn't really a lot of models for the perfect relationship. You had a lot of relationships that would, you know, people would say, okay, we're abiding by religious laws or going by certain social things. And I saw many of those relationships that would abide by these rules and things like that. But there wasn't a frequency that my heart was like, yes, that, that feels so good. That feels so right. The way that they're living, the way that they look at each other, the way that they talk to each other, the way that they touch each other, the way that they, you know, move in the world together is beautiful to me. It is that harmony. Mm. It feels like a symphony. The energetics of their presence is absolutely it just enthralling. I'm captivated by that. And it should be, and it can be a deeper understanding of how you show up in the world and how you see each other and what effect do you have on the people around you? It was learning that through trial and error, through good relationships, yep. through bad relationships, through my own actions, my own folly. That's the big difference is a lot of times people have certain rules that are set up for them. And when they progress, they're not consciously saying, why am I doing this? How does, how does this really benefit me and everybody else around me? What choice am I making? It's just, oh, it's a cool thing to do and I'm in it. Oh, no, I shouldn't do that. That'll make someone else mad. So I'm not going to talk about it. And then I'll just do that. And they'll keep doing that. And then all of a sudden, you're like kind of twisted around. It's like, oh, yeah, but you're not just like clear. You don't feel that you're acting from integrity because you're not. You've, you've twisted yourself, your values. You can't be honest with yourself. You can't be honest with others. And people are only around you because you've only communicated certain aspects of yourself and saying, hey, I'm going to be myself and I'll communicate the things that work within this group but I'm going to integrate everything. I'm going to be who I am and I'm not going to force this on anybody else, but I'm going to choose to live extremely honest with myself. And mm. people will either connect with me based on that or disconnect with me. And that's fine. Our drive for this tribalism and to be in included is one of our main drives as human beings is to not to be kicked out of the tribe, not to be shamed, not to be, you know, that stuff. You know, back in the day when we were tribal people, if you're kicked out of the tribe, your chances for survival go way down. So you want to be accepted Over. by people. You want to feel that you're welcomed amongst other people. And nowadays, we 
there's a group somewhere for you. So the question is, how honest can you be with yourself and how loving can you be to yourself for your uniqueness? When there's a lack of honesty, it almost doesn't matter what else you tried to build on top of it. Remove all the masks, remove all the layers, remove all the ways that you like tried to show up uh, shinier than you actually are. Otherwise, anything you try to stack on top of it, it just won't work. The foundation isn't secure. So exactly. even when people get this, get to this place of like, oh, I want to find my the things that matter to me, or I want to define it. If you're not living from alignment or are not able to tap into that space, it it just none of it works. You said something that I, you know, I want to emphasize is, you mm -hmm. know, if you're not of alignment and you're building, what I consider those is manufactured desires. Right. So yeah. you're you're creating a desire that might not even be yours, which often leads to unsatisfaction once it's fulfilled. And so those manufactured desires come when you're not in integrity versus like, oh, this is something I really want to do. It might be weird. It might seem a little bit dangerous. I want to go skydiving. This is it. But when I do it, I'm ultimately satisfied versus I do it and I don't really feel anything. <laughs> and that's that's the difference. Yep. So I, I think that's a, a big point you made. Hmm. Well, I'm actively trying to live open handed and try stuff that I, I don't typically try. And uh, so people have challenged me to, it could be anything from like, I did an hour long meditation, I need to go do a fire walk because of a previous guest. Uh, I have to drive to Philly soon to get to get a cheesesteak with one of the previous people I talked to. So I will throw this at you like, what's one thing that I can go do go try a, like a growth mechanism for me once we leave this conversation and I will, I will go attempt or try that thing. What I would say is make a list of 10 people that really affected you in a positive way and call them and give your deepest heartfelt gratitude as if they were going to die or you were going to die today. Dang. All right. Well, I will do that and I will report back. That's part of this too. It's like, I want to tell you the impact that that makes. I can already sense what that, some of the stuff it would bring up. You can feel it or I feel yeah, it. It comes up, doesn't it? Chest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's that's super no, vulnerable. I, I, I love that too, from the place of the more that I've gotten into realizing how encouragement is literally, I think Brene Brown says this, but like when you think of the word encourage, it's just pouring courage into people. Uh. <laughs> so when you encouragement is such a cool idea, because what you're saying is when I tell you the truth about you, the thing that I see that's so beautiful in you, it's like I'm pouring courage into you. And it just gives you like this fire. It's like pouring fuel on you when it comes from this authentic place where it's like, I see you. I see you right now. I didn't say this earlier when you brought up uh, thinking about the last, like the end of your life. I have said it on the podcast before, but like the two most impactful things so far that I've done, one is figuring out values and trying to live into those things. And the second one is writing my own eulogy. That exercise was really powerful. And it's something that you, people get bogged down on like, oh, I don't know if I would have it perfect. or I don't know what I'd say, but just attempting even and putting yourself in that frame of mind. I totally resonated when you were saying that. So, uh, man, this has been awesome. fascinating. So thank you. Uh, a million times over for jumping on undercurrents. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to chat with you. Thanks again, Benji.